Marco Byrne, sitting beside me here in the studio, is an entrepreneur who has the great good fortune to also have a history degree, so he knows how to put facts in context. Mark has criticised in the strongest possible terms the impact of lockdowns on us all. He's also highly critical of the corrupt Irish financial system, which he sees as the root of many of our problems. For that reason, he trades in gold and silver, and why wouldn't you? So we're going to start by just looking generally at what's going on. So we'll ask Mark to look at the international scene and then Eddie to look at the national scene, if you would, please, in plain language, by the way. Right, so we'll start with you, Mark. What's happening internationally? Yeah, well, thanks for the introduction. And, uh, yeah, it was a very good introduction and you, and you summed it up very well in terms of the, the wider context of, of what's going on in, in, in Ireland and the world, you know. Uh, we basically have a massive COVID scare uh, and they're using it for, I think, Pre, pre-designed uh, agendas uh, are, are coming to fruition, you know. So the bottom line is that the, 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 in terms of globally, we already had a massive global debt bubble, like astronomical. Uh, we're talking about 250 trillion. I know you don't want me using big numbers and all the rest, but I, I'm going to help How people many understand. Is that? Yeah, so it's a very, very big number. When I started out in business in 2003, it, you know, we used to talk about millions, and a million was a lot of money, and then it was billions, and that was a lot of money. And then in recent years, we're talking about trillions. So a trillion is one with 12 zeros after it. So it's zero, 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 zero. Is that a billion, billion? No, it's a million, million. Yeah. Right. Or a thousand billion. Yeah. But you're nearly there. So it's a huge, it's a huge number. Uh, and, and that number is now bandied around and people don't realize the scale of it, you know. And then to, to, so people understand. So globally, the debt is between just different institutions uh, internationally have uh, different figures for it. But it's roughly between 250 trillion and 300 trillion. So it's absolutely ginormous. Uh, and it's, it, this is a gigantic monetary experiment. Basically, they're experimenting with the currency. We've never done this before in history, you know. And we used to print money and it created huge issues. Now we're electronically creating on a keyboard. They just create trillions of dollars, euros and pounds, you know. And it's not just dollars uh, that is happening. It's happening in all the currencies, you know. So the debt in itself doesn't matter if the GDP is, is keeping up with the debt. But the GDP is actually obviously fallen because of, not because of COVID, but because of the lockdowns and the government response has led to a massive contraction of all of our economies because they've shut us up and they've shut down all the, the vital small to medium enterprises in all of our economies. These are the backbones of most economies in the world, whether it be Ireland, Germany, and it's very important even in America, you know. So the corporations are having a field day, you know. But the GDP uh, last year, I think it was 80, global GDP was 85 trillion. So it's tr- the debt is three times bigger than the global GDP. And what's global GDP for your, for your listeners uh, uh, on Facebook and YouTube, YouTube? So GDP is gross domestic product, and basically it's the trading of goods and services between every single member of the planet, all 8 billion of us. So all 8 billion of us in one year, we trade goods and services between us. Uh, and that comes to a value of just below 90 trillion. But the global debt is nearly 300 trillion. So it's nearly three times more. And you have a sovereign debt crisis, national debt crisis, as we had in Ireland and many countries around the world in the 2008 to 2012 period, uh, when global, uh, or sorry, when national debt to GDP goes over 150, 200%. So this is, you know, it's, it's a massive Ponzi scheme and, uh, and it's liable to collapse, unfortunately, you know. Where is the debt held? I know that sounds like a really stupid question. What is debt? Do you well, know what I mean? Basically, is it in a the bank? form of is it money we have bank? today is, is debt. So uh, the central banks are just, you know, not even printing it. They're electronically creating trillions and trillions. So who holds the debt? I mean, institutions hold the debt, pension funds. You, you know, all of us uh, who have pensions uh, tend to be in, in uh, portfolios mm-hmm. of equities and bonds. Uh, but the, the biggest holders uh, are actually the, the banks themselves because they've been buying a lot of this debt in quantitative easing. They electronically create the currency and then they buy the, the bonds, you know. But what's happening now, and we, we all forgave that in 2008, 2009, 2010, because, you know, the, the risk was the financial system was going to collapse, the, the, all the sovereigns were under pressure and, and the governments were going to go bankrupt. So the central bank said, right, we'll 
print money or electronically create money to buy the bonds in order to keep the interest rates low. So we all accepted that as a sort of a Faustian bargain, a short-term solution. But many of us warned at the time, including Eddie and myself, that this would not be a short-term solution. This would likely go on and on. Uh, and you know, QE1 became QE2 and QE3. So I've given the global context, but the US alone in the last year has done $8 trillion worth of QE just in this last 12 months. And now they're not, they used to print the money or create the money just to buy US Treasuries, which are considered very safe bonds throughout history. US Treasuries are considered, along with gold, two of the safest assets in the world. And uh, now they're actually buying junk bonds. They're buying uh, corporate bonds, so the bonds of companies, but not just the best of companies, some of the worst of companies, the junk bonds have been bought. Uh, they're buying stocks, they're buying ETFs. Companies like Hertz Rent-A-Car, uh, a rent-a-car company, why are they supporting this? So they're, they're basically realized the whole system is now vulnerable and they're having to support it uh, artificially. It's, it's on a life support machine in effect, you know. But the net result of this is that the currencies are gonna be massively debased and we've seen that throughout history. We're just gonna see a new form of currency debasement. And when you debase a currency, Basically, it's, you create too much of it, and then the value is diluted. Well, like That's it in a nutshell. Some of those African nations were... Exactly, yeah. Um, the, the Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe, Bala. yeah, yeah, Argentina. Yeah. Uh, but it was seen in, in Germany, obviously, is a classic example, yeah. in, in 1918, after World War One, And they were one of the most advanced, sophisticated economies in the world, you know. Uh, and they lost the war, incurred huge debt. But arguably, the debts today, uh, on the global scale, are on a par of what was in Germany uh, part of their hyperinflation. So there are a lot of people now warning that hyperinflation is your real worst case scenario when your currency complete, gets completely wiped out. And that's a possibility, but more likely is stagflation, where we see contracting mm -hmm. economic growth and, and significant inflation in, in the value. Particularly, of, I said you did this before, uh, the show started, uh, you see luxury goods, goods that we don't need, like big cars, fancy cars, and has a lot of debt attached to it, you'll see deflation. But the, uh, like, petrol in your car, food, water, the essentials of life, we're likely to see, likely to see quite, quite a bit of inflation. Yeah. How have we ended up in a situation where governments seem to be able to loan? I mean, if you or I went to the bank and asked for the kind of money, we'd be told to get lost and they'd be, you know, we'd be, have to pay a huge whack of interest. How has this happened? We'll go oh, to well, Mark first. Well, yeah, it's been happening for a long period of time. So this is... Like long period meaning what? Uh, possibly since the end, no, I was going to say the end of the Second World War. No, I'd say probably 71. Uh, so Nixon 71. went off the gold standard in 1971. And that was, Eddie mentioned Bretton Woods there. Yeah. So Bretton Woods was the monetary system that they set up after 1945, mm -hmm. which basically was a form mm -hmm. of a gold standard, a gold exchange standard, whereby the people weren't on the gold standard, the currencies weren't on the gold standard, but the nations, each nation's uh, budgets would have to be balanced in gold. Yeah. So you'd have export uh, surpluses, deficits, and they would settle every single year. And so in 71, Nixon said, we're not doing that anymore, which gave America what, what uh, Guy Starr de Stein called a, an exorbitant privilege. And that allowed America to start living beyond their means. And they started consuming uh, the world's resources uh, and, and, and their corporations became more and more powerful. It, it conferred quite a few uh, advantages to them, you know. Um, uh, and basically they've lived way beyond their means for a long period of time. But that trajectory, they, they, they have long been uh, so supporting corporations over the interests of the people, over uh, communities, over small businesses. That's been the way in America for a long period of time, particularly since the 80s. I think it, it got 80s, accelerated. Yeah. You see this huge financialization. And in effect, we don't have capitalism anymore. We have a form of cor mm. corporatocracy where the corporations basically right. run the show. The politicians are minions. And it's it's and now it's clear it's actually a form of it's a technocratic feudalism that we have, whereby there's been a, almost a fusion of these large institutions like the IMF, the World Bank, even the EU to a degree. It's like they're all working hand in glove with the, the Amazons and the Facebooks and Google, and it's it's very very dangerous, very anti democratic, you know. And and these Davos elites, you know, these billionaires who have made an absolute fortune in in in, in these lockdowns because they've shut down all the competition because they have the technology, they have the e commerce platforms. So they made I think the the zero the, I think it's ten of the richest men in the world. So zero point zero zero one percent of the planet, or even less. 
they made 500 billion in the last 12 months, while the rest of us, the global GDP fell, and the rest of us lost a huge amount of money, and people lost their jobs and all the rest, you know. And, and Eddie's point about the people on fixed income, when inflation takes off, the people who own these assets, like these people, will be protected, because they, they have purchasing power in their businesses, and they own assets. They would own gold, they own land. A lot of these people are actually moving to buy land in a very big way, which is interesting. But the people who will suffer are the people on the fixed income. So the pensioners on the fixed income, and the unemployed, all these poor people on the COVID payments, you know, people giving out, all oh, these people are on 350 a week for doing nothing, and it's like, these people want, the vast, vast majority of people want to work, obviously, you know, and, and the government has actually shut down all their businesses, taken away all their employment, taken away their livelihood, and, 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 and basically destroyed the backbone of our economy, you know, in the interest of these large corporations, and that's what's happened, and, and, and people need to start waking up and, and acknowledging that fact. Why I mean, is there this need to terrorise us? I don't get it. I mean, it started with the WHO declaring a pandemic when it wasn't really a pandemic yeah, uh, by true. the classical definition of a pa pandemic, you know, uh, which used to be both the infection rate and the mortality rate. And then they did away with the mortality rate. It used to be an excess of mortality. Uh, then they focus solely on the infection, you know. And uh, so and it, it starts with those bureaucrats. And, and that's a very corrupt organization. And it's been proven to be corrupt, particularly in, in recent years, you know, and in terms of it's funded by big pharma. There's massive conflicts of interest, yeah. left, right and center. And, and Bill Gates with all his conflicts of interest as well. Tedros himself is borderline terrorist uh, out of Ethiopia, you know. So there's so many questions there. But then our guys, uh, Tony Hula in, in Enfit, and there's issues with his background as well. He should not be in that position. He should have been made to resign years ago. You know, it's outrageous that he's still in that position. Uh, and the cervical uh, uh, check uh, scandal as well, you know. So uh, he, these guys just defer to, 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 you mentioned SAGE, they defer to WHO and SAGE. And, and they're not doing their own research because they can just blame that the global bureaucracy has said this, you know. And then the George Lee and these people uh, defer to these health bureaucrats. Uh, and I think it, also they're looking at the BBC and the CNN. And there's a lot, it's massive mm -hmm. group think on a scale. It, it's very much akin to the property bubble that we had in, in Ireland. Yeah. And indeed globally, yeah. there was a massive bubble in 2007, 2008. 2008, and very few people ask any questions about it whatsoever, you know, and those 40, 50, 60 page property supplements, and everybody bought into that narrative. There's only a tiny, um, tiny, tiny minority of, of people who are asking questions about it. And it's the same today, And but the emperor has no clothes. The narrative is so, it's lies upon lies upon lies. It's just a tissue mm -hmm. of lies, and, and, and it can be exposed very, very, very quickly. But one thing I just, in terms of what Eddie said, he's absolutely right. There's been oligarchs throughout history, and now we have massive oligarchs. And it's funny that CNN and the BBCs and the RTs, they talk about the Russian oligarchs you know and they're these evil oligarchs in Russia you know and they support Putin it's like can we not look at the own oligarchs here who are in Davos with this Klaus Schwab neo-fascist type you know because we are heading in a it's a it, fascism is basically when uh, the state and the corporations get together uh, and they work together hand in glove against the interests of the small medium enterprises there's a few select corporations uh, who do very well but the majority of the people and the businesses uh, do not do very well you know so the other point that Eddie made that's very important is this this thing of the move to the DCBC so the, the dig, digital central bank currencies. So we're going to move to not even paper. At least if you had euros, you could take your few 50 euro notes out and you could put them into a safety deposit box or put them under the mattresses as Irish people used to do. They're quite, people used to sneer at these Irish people put money under the mattress, but they're actually quite, I think they're quite prudent, you know, given uh, how our banks have turned out to be. So now you won't be able to do that. You're going to be completely dependent on not even your bank, your central bank, who will issue the currency directly into your, into your, into your account. And these guys, these oligarchs, look at China as a model. They love communist China, and they love the, the social credit score. They love the power that the Chinese elites have over the 1.3 billion people, the masses, because they're scared of the masses. They're very scared of the masses. They want to control us, ultimately. And this ultimately, this whole scandemic is about, it's about data, it's about profit, and it's about control. That's mm -hmm. the three things that's going on. So what, what do we do? I mean, we're, we're kind of slightly running out of time now, but... What well, we do, your next guest, the man down in Cork, fair play to him, who yeah. organised that protest in Cork, we need to start standing up and, and speaking the truth. The media has silenced us, as Eddie has said. They try to make us out that we're, we're total headbangers and conspiracy theorists, you know. Yeah. But there's a lot more people share our view than we realise. And I think it could be 25, 30, 35 percent of the population have views akin to us. But the media has made out that everybody's on the same page. We all agree it's a terrible virus. And they've, in effect, programmed people with fear. That's what they've done, well, you they know. Have. It's mass psychosis. It's, uh, you know, 
know, Extraordinary Popular Delusions. There's a great book, uh, Extraordinary Popular Delusions and, 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 and Madness of Crowds. Yeah. And we, we just throughout history, we've lost a run of ourselves and, you know, gave rise to the likes of Hitler, obviously, you know. So we're in one of these periods of time when it's mass psychosis and you ca actually can't speak to these people, you know. But we have to stand up. We have to speak our truth. The, the protests that happened in Dublin and Cork are very important. They have to be peaceful. There will always be one or two idiots or, you know, even 1% of, of, of the protests that might be violent. But the vast, vast majority in Dublin, and I was at that protest, 99.9% .9 of them were actually peaceful. And the media completely ignored that. And then you have journalists and RTE calling for censorship. And they're actually going to big tech companies like Facebook and Twitter and telling, the journalists are telling tech to censor the people. It's absolutely what? outrageous stuff. Yeah, this is what's, what's happening in RTE uh, at the weekend on the Brennan and O'Connor Show. So it's a very dangerous thing when when journalists start calling for yeah. censorship. It's it's very very dangerous, you know. So what we we can do in terms of vote, we we need to. I think civil disobedience is important as well. Small businesses, farmers, they need to start. In particularly in rural areas and small towns, they need to start open up their businesses and get on with they things. Are. And they, doing they are doing it already, exactly. And you see it. I'm out on the roads quite a bit, and this traffic is out there. These people are not in their 5K, you know. People are getting on planes, they're going around the world. They're ignoring this because they know it's nonsense. It's literally nonsense. So we need to step up and say, enough is enough. We've had enough of this now. You've, yeah. had, you've had your fun, lads. And it's time for people to stand up and say, we, we have the power. The people have the power. They always have the power. But they, they've taken the power away by, by programming people with fear. But we're greater than that. And we will overcome this as we've overcome. You look at the Irish history. We're, we're, this is just, it's a bad flu. It is a, quite a serious flu, absolutely. absolutely. But you don't shut down and quarantine healthy people in their house and shut down your entire economy and destroy the mental health mm -hmm. of your men, women and children. I mean, it's, I heard of a, a family friend today who committed suicide. So this is what's going on out there. There's going to be an epidemic of suicides mm -hmm. in the coming months mm -hmm. and years, you know. And potentially more people will die of that than the... You know, the eight-year-olds and nine-year-olds who are dying of this virus, you know, and many pe people, they were going to die and they've had good lives, most of them, hopefully, you know, and we should be celebrating their lives. We should be going to their funerals and, 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 and talking about them and exchanging stories. Instead, they have these tragic, barbaric deaths. It's just absolutely outrageous, you know. We have to, we have to say stop, enough is enough, you know. How do we stop uh, the financial establishments in our country from being the bosses. They should be subservient to us rather than the other way around. Is there any way we can stop there is, yeah, this? Yeah. You, you have to vote with your 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 money is one mm -hmm. thing because as you said, you're, a lot of people feel disenfranchised, mm -hmm. and you look at all the political parties, uh, the Greens, Sinn Fein, even the so-called opposition. Sorry, the Greens are in government, Sinn Fein and Labour in opposition. They're nearly worse. They're pushing for this crazy zero zero COVID. It's like zero brain cells. You know, there's never been zero viruses ever. We, we, there's thousands of viruses uh, in us, millions of viruses floating around the planet all the time. You know, so it's total. As Eddie said, it's not science based. That's the thing. So. So, but how you can vote is actually by taking power back. You have to become independent and sovereign. You have to become your own sovereign, independent of the system. And the way you do that is you take some of your money, your hard-earned money out of the system, and you put it into things that have value conferred by nature that are finite and rare. So things like land and water and gold and silver. So gold and silver coins are a very condensed form of money, and they're very rare and, and they're finite. And people don't realize how rare they are, and that's why they've been money throughout history, you know. So that's a way to say we've had enough of your shenanigans, because in effect we're financing them by, by leaving our money in banks and by putting our money into stocks of somebody's corporations, you know. Uh, you know, our, our pension funds, is go, it's going into Facebook and Apple and Netflix and Pfizer and all the rest of them. So we need to start putting money into and into, into land and, and, and grow our own food and, and and, you know, we're, we're blessed in this country. We're going to come through this because we're in a much better place than most countries in the world, you know, because we're, we're blessed with good land, good water. But the corporations and these oligarchs, they have the signs on that as well. You know, they're, they're not backing down until we step up to them and say, well, we've had enough now. You've had your fun, lads. You've made enough money at our expense. It's, it's now time for the people and communities to step up and take the power back. You know, we have the power. We just, they tell us that we don't. And, and they, you know, the TINA, T-I-N-A, there is no alternative. There's always alternatives. And we need to create the alternatives. And that's what we're going to do in the coming months and years. The way you deal with uh, propaganda is you have to call out the propagandists. You have to be prepared to stand up and say, sorry, that's not news. Yeah. That's not news you've been feeding me every night for the last uh, year. Your job has been to scare the shit out of me.
and I'm not taking it anymore. That's exactly what they've done. Yeah, it is propaganda in effect. Yeah, well, I and, and, and they program people with fear. They brainwash them in effect. You know, and they and they have the cheek to then project and invert it and make out that we're brainwashed when the opposite is the truth. You know, but ultimately, I think voting is is important. It's part of it, particularly getting that grassroots, the communities, the local local mm. elections, local democracy. But we have to be very careful as well. A lot of these machines, this digital thing that we're moving towards, and the feudal technocratic elites. They uh, these machines will be rigged, so you have to be very careful. Uh, you know, uh, and I think there is something to be said for a paper ballot ultimately. You know, uh, and that way you might get some some real democracy. But ultimately, you know, politics is is a part of the solution. Economics is a part of the solution. Um, our own psychology, working our own psych, 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 psychology and, and, and our spirituality as well. I do think to transcend this, it's much bigger than politics. You know, because there's so much fear out there. People are brainwashed. We need to go back into our hearts. And we actually need to forgive these people. It's outrageous what they're doing, but we have to forgive them. A lot of them are psychos. We have to acknowledge what they are. But then you have to forgive them. But then you have to put them on trial. You have to put them away yeah. for life. And then we have to get you know rebuild again, but not, not this crazy build back better that they're trying to create of this sort of corporate uh, dystopian mm -hmm. utopia, uh, like some uh, hybrid Chinese communist fascist type of thing. We, we have to build, we need to actually get clear on the vision, what we really want to be as a society in 20, 30 years. We create our own vision, not their vision, and then we work towards that. And unless we start having that conversation, mm -hmm. you know, then then we live into their their vision, which is quite dystopian, obviously. Well, I think, I think we've a job.